just like to welcome everybody to um, this event with the Friends of Belside Community Library. Um, just a couple of remarks before we begin. One is that I'm um, very sorry to have to announce the very recent death of Myron Newman, who was a key member of the uh, Friends Committee and um, committed to libraries in the area over a long period of time. She was a librarian at Chalk Farm Library, as it then was, and very active in the Primrose Hill area. And had, I think, also worked as librarian at uh, Belsize Library in the past too. Uh, has been a member of the, uh, had been a member of our committee for several years and very active in uh, attracting um, speakers for our event. So we're really very sorry we passed our condolences to her friends and family. There will be some sort of um, memorial or commemorative event for Myra in the library, probably towards the end of June, um, which will involve several of the people that she's worked with in her various capacities over the years. And obviously we'll let you have more details about that when we know how that's uh, going to work out. It may possibly be as one of the mini public assemblies that Tom Selwyn has been putting on in the library. So that's a rather sad piece of news. Um, as far as this meeting is concerned, um, Peter shortly will be introducing our speaker, Justin Rolat, uh, who we're very delighted to welcome. Um, there will be the opportunity for questions and Justin will emphasize that as he goes through his talk, I think. And um, if you can put your questions in the chat and we'll try and answer them um, from the chat, there may or may not be an opportunity for people to speak directly later, later on, depending how many questions we've got and how we're doing for time and so on. So if you would keep yourselves on mute during the um, <coughs> meeting, um, other than the possibility of being involved in some discussion at the end, that would be extremely helpful. So um, having said that, um, just to emphasize again that uh, these meetings, which we currently ask for a donation for when they're held in the library are being delivered free over Zoom, but if anybody cares to make a small donation, I think it, just at the moment, if you could contact Peter, who's our treasurer in the address, which we put in the chat and uh, send any donations to him and we'll make sure that those go appropriately to the library. So having said that, I'll pass you over to Peter, who's going to introduce <coughs> our guest speaker. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> It's always a special pleasure to introduce and welcome someone who's lived in the area, particularly someone who enjoys schooling around the corner from here at Fleet Primary and who is no stranger to our library. Uh, Justin started his environmental interest as the Newsnight ethical man and is a green man world specialist. He's worked and presented numerous BBC programmes, which I'm sure many of you have seen, including very descriptive travels around India, China, and Russia. In America, he, the emphasis was on climate change. So he knows all the people who are going to be involved later this year. He lived in Delhi for a couple of years as the BBC's lead report of Southeast Asia. During this time, he produced fascinating insights into other worlds. As the BBC's chief environment officer, this will be the extremely busy period for us, for Justin, with a much heralded international conference in the UK later this year. So Justin, over to you for the pyrotechnics history of humanity. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for that introduction, Peter. Yeah, I remember it was Antrim Grove Library when I used to go to the library, and I do remember it well. Um, I grew up in just uh, up the road from there, and as Peter said, I went to Fleet Primary School. In fact, my kids, unusually, um, three of my four children um, spent time at Fleet, so I'm heavily, you know, I've spent a lot of time in this area and in this community. Yeah, I'm to be the BBC's chief environment correspondent, and as Peter says, this is a really exciting and important year for climate, not just in Britain, obviously, but around the world. Um, we are hosting this huge conference. If it was being hosted 
in person as we expected it to be prior to the pandemic. It would be the biggest meeting of world leaders ever to have been held in the UK. So a huge meeting. It's still enormously important for the climate. It's also enormously important politically for the government, a big post-Brexit event that Boris Johnson's delighted to be hosting. Um, so we, I've been focusing a lot of attention, obviously, on you know, the, issue, you know, the, 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 the kind of machinations around the conference and the issues that will be being discussed there and you know, the progress with Biden and Xi Jinping in China and making big announcements, that kind of stuff. And alongside that um, was, uh, was a project that uh, me and a longtime collaborator of mine, a guy called Lawrence Knight, had kind of cooked up uh, earlier on and managed to persuade uh, Radio 4 to take, which was, which was, we call it, we, I, I was very pleased with the title actually, uh, we call it a pyrotechnic history of humanity, which obviously is a, is quite a big idea, the idea of uh, fire. Um, and it was rooted in, I, we actually did a long series for the World Service about the chemical elements. And it was during the making of that, that it became clear that our destiny our history is intensely bound to how much energy we use. We've got a really good statistic in our program, which is that a resting human being consumes 90 watts of energy. So about the same as those old incandescent light bulbs that um, we all used to have. Um, and a modern human being, um, an American, oh, they consume considerably more energy than anyone else, but an American uses I think it's 10,000 watts or thereabouts. So a hundred times in the case of America, slightly more than a hundred times the amount of energy. And the journey from that primate, you know, just satisfying their own kind of, you know, bi biochemical needs, if you like, you know, their own uh, met metabolic requirements to this huge consumption of energy that we all are involved with now seemed to me a really interesting lens to understand the kind of history of our species. You know, in a way, it kind of encapsulates everything you need to know about humanity. Um, and uh, I kind of began reading, I've got family members coming in and out, but I began reading, uh, I began reading uh, about this and there's some fascinating developments that really persuaded us this was a, a really interesting area to explore. The, there's a kind of growing understanding of early man and the development of the kind of evolution of of Homo sapiens as a species and what differentiates them from other primates, which links their development to the, uh, the discovered fire. And there are, there are anthropologists who argue that we, we co-evolved with fire, that our biology was determined in part by our relationship with this external source of energy, where the only animal who, who exploits energy in that way. And the idea is that by cooking food, you kind of denature it, you soften it, you make it easier, the calories more accessible, the uh, nutrients more accessible. Um, so in a way you're kind of externalizing digestion. You're, the, the cooking itself is a kind of pre-digestion and means that you can absorb the energy and nutrients much more quickly. Now, if you think about what that would do to your physiology, you probably expect maybe you wouldn't need such a big stomach, you wouldn't need such a big intestine, um, you know, you wouldn't need to put so much work into digesting food. A huge amount of energy for other animals goes into digestion and indeed chewing. Apes apparently chew, will, will routinely chew for six hours a day to break down the food they eat in order to make the energy accessible. Um, and obviously, you know, not having to do that is a huge uh, liberation uh, for a species. So the idea is we co-evolve with fire and you can see that in our physiology. You can see we have a much shorter gut than apes. And we also, of course, have a much bigger brain. And, uh, you know, obviously, if you've got a, a, a bigger, a more a ready, a, an easier supply of energy, it's quite likely that you will be able to support energetic activities like a big brain. Brains consume a lot of energy. So there's a kind of feedback loop that as we as we um, as we as we access this energy through these new ways of of accessing calories in the form of cooking, our brains got bigger. And as our brains got bigger, we kind of probably thought up new ways of, uh, of accessing energy. A lot of this, of course, you, know, you, can, you can see the physiological changes in the fossil record. You obviously can't necessarily trace the, uh, the detailed evolution, you know, associating developments with particular behaviors that human beings had. But obviously we began to develop very basic tools which allowed us to grind or cut 
food and again another way of accessing the energy within it so the answer is that um there's a kind of as i say a feedback loop and this was a theme throughout this series that there are that we access feedback loops which encourage us to develop further so neurons um don't attach to an, an additional neuron doesn't isn't just doesn't just attach to one other brain cell they attach there are dozens of, of, of links between brain cells. So as you add more neurons to a brain, you get a much more complex network. And with a more complex network, you get a more intelligent brain. And this is not a linear process. This is a, an exponential process. So you know, each additional neuron creates much more complexity. And therefore, you get, in theory at least, a much more intelligent brain. The more intelligent brain is better able to adapt to its environment and develop new tools and so forth releasing yet more energy and encouraging da, 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 da. so you see there's a feedback loop that might might have encouraged us to become significantly more intelligent than other species which of course is you know i mean a debate about how clever animals are clearly animals are clever and some are much cleverer than others but we see in terms of neural density the number of neurons in our brain we're right up there i think there are only a few animals that have a greater density of neurons which include very interestingly, and this is a complete side and didn't appear in the program, COVID's uh, um, uh, crows, the crow family um, have very, very, very dense brains. But anyway, that's just an aside, but we developed this powerful brain. Um, and so, and this, that was kind of the first, so co-evolving with fire, our first program seemed a natural kind of progression for the first program in the series. And then the question is, where did humanity go from here? And this is really interesting because we evolved these short, these large brains and short guts maybe 500,000 years ago, 500,000 years ago. And yet, as you know, civilization is a very, very recent thing. You know, it's only within the last 12,000 years that there's evidence that we settled and began to, to, began to practice agriculture. So there's a real question about what was happening over this, this half a million year period. And we had the wherewithal, the intelligence, arguably, to farm. We developed increasingly complex tools, but very, very slowly. You know, the rate of development year by year, people's lives didn't change for half a million years. And then suddenly in the Holocene, this, this interglacial period we're in now, suddenly around the world, different communities using different crops and different animals began to farm. And I think it's really interesting that it happened. And, you know, obviously, I mean, I'm not the only one, you know, experts around the world. I think it's fascinating that it developed all, it's simultaneously, it appears, almost simultaneously over the course of a couple of thousand years, all around the world. You know, so in Asia, in China, in, in, uh, in you know, um, South Asia, in the Philippines, in, not in the Philippines, you know, in the Pacific region, South America, North America, all independently started farming. And the question is why? And the geological record tells us that temperatures until the Holocene were actually very variable. Not only did we have ice ages, and in ice ages, obviously it's very cold, it's much harder in lots of regions of the world to grow crops. You also have a lower carbon dioxide level, uh, typically uh, during the ice age, and therefore you had, uh, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't as easy for plants to grow. Um, and then in the Holocene, temperatures rose by about five degrees, the average temperature. But crucially, they also stabilized. So you had this very stable, calm, but also very productive, warm, carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, which it appears, the, the people you know, extrapolate that this then allowed us to suddenly access the ability to plant and grow our own, uh, our own crops. Because prior to that, it was so unpredictable because of the climate that you couldn't guarantee that you'd be able to raise a harvest. It wasn't worth, if you like, the energetic investment of, of agriculture because the returns were so uncertain. In this new stable environment of the Holocene, the investment returns were worth it. And as I say, simultaneously across the world, communities began to develop initially, obviously, very rudimentary farming, found the the grains that were that were susceptible, that were that that lent themselves to, to, to agriculture and began to, in a, again, a kind of dance, a kind of co-evolution is what how many of the uh, of the scientists describe it. That you know, the, it was beneficial for the plants, 
to be to be nurtured by human beings. You know, I mean, there are many more wheat plants alive now than there ever would have been in the past. The wheat plants were benefiting and we were benefiting too. Again, a kind of co-evolution, um, both uh, parties benefiting um, and different crops in different areas, rice, grains, you know, um, uh, corn in, in, a, in the Americas, um, married to different different animals that we also began to nurture, goats, sheep, cows, llamas, you know, depending on who you are, were. These became a kind of uh, agricultural packages is the way they're described, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a complementary suite of plants and animals that work very well together. And the way we describe this, I'm slightly disturbing. Can, can, can you go away, please? So I've got two children trying to distract me, which is it, which is distracting. Um, and uh, so we've got these suites of, uh, of plants and animals. Um, and so our insight, if you like, our, our way of presenting this was that this too is an energy revolution. You know, this is you know what 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 human beings were doing. I'm getting a sign saying my my internet is unstable. I do hope you can still hear me. Um, what human beings were doing, if you think what agriculture is, think of a field, think what you see with the field, the crops growing there are a way of harvesting the energy of the sun and embodying it in the crops that you're growing. Um, and so in a sense, this is, a, this is the original solar panel. This is a solar panel. This is a means of collecting solar energy into, if you think about it, a storable kind of energy currency you can harvest your wheat and dry it and you can store it. So suddenly you've got something that we never had before, which was the ability to store energy and decide how you're going to use it in the future. Did you save some of it to invest in the harvest next year? Did you, uh, maybe you could convert it into meat in the form of one of these animals that you were raising or dairy in the case of cows, sheep and goats. Did you, invest in, in, a, in the original power tools, the animals that you use, the draft animals that you maybe discovered that you could use to plow your field. But you can see that suddenly you've got, an, you've got a transferable energy currency that, uh, that can be used in all sorts of different ways. You could trade with, uh, with, uh, with other people for perhaps they had a store of grains or you wanted to buy their goat or whatever. So suddenly human relationships changed very dramatically in terms of what we could do, what we could store. These surpluses also created other opportunities, opportunities that perhaps a little bit more sinister, the opportunity for hierarchies. Some people would be better saving their money, saving their grain, not money, sorry, saving their grain, establishing uh, a big store of grain and then maybe using that uh, to, to enforce their dominance over people. Perhaps they stole the in to get hierarchies and you begin to get inequalities. And these were, these, I mean, it's not that these didn't exist in hunter-gatherer societies, but hunter-gatherer societies tended to be much more level. If you're moving with, uh, with other human beings, possessions, you know, are not, uh, you know, it's not easy, it's not possible to, store, to have as many possessions. And if you're, and it, it's for the sake of the group, they tend to share everything, if not evenly, but then by, by need. So they're much more egalitarian society. So we began to see inequality developing, but also people in communities, information, feedback, information that allowed them, for example, to deliver, to, to develop you know, new technologies, the draft animals, the plough perhaps initially, then maybe forms of, in a, uh, of irrigation and share them between other communities. You've got a building, growing body of knowledge, embodied obviously in writing and art, which uh, flourished in these early civilizations. So here you've got, first of all, the co-evolution into these intelligent primates, the Homo sapiens with and becoming bigger, far more numerous, but evolving into, into structured communities that we later become, come to call, civiliz call civilization. So again, an energetic revolution, the energy harvested through agriculture, allowing the development of this new stage of humanity, uh, a structured civilization. And in that sense, I mean, you know, we didn't dwell on this. Half an hour, which is how much we have for each program is 
really as soon as you start to you know kind of talk about a subject as rich and complex and uh huge as this you can't include everything but obviously art and culture was born out of these civilizations the ability of human beings to express themselves always comes through this i mean causality you know is uh, is, is is debatable but obviously partly this is because we had the energetic resources that allowed us to have time and leisure to do some of these things and to and to invest them with value and share them and and treasure them so so much of what we are as human beings in a sense is a result of that, as we describe it, energetic revolution. But again, there's another mystery here, just as we had the mystery of the 500,000 years of almost static human development, uh, after 12,000 years of farming, the average income of most human, I mean, some people, you know, obviously we had these hierarchies, the, uh, the elites, the kings and the emperors, whatever, would be, would be, were quite, wealthy they had these stores of grain not wealthy by any means on the scale even ordinary people now but 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 there were these inequalities of wealth but the majority of people the people who worked the land um had standards of living that many anthropologists believe were actually worse than the original hunter gatherers who had this very diverse um kind of food sources and tended to actually eat quite well and not work nearly as hard so they think you know looking at the bone gatherers looking at hunter gathering communities the few that survive now in the modern world they actually don't spend a huge amount of time hunting and gathering they do a little bit of hunting if they're lucky they get some food they come home and eat it and then they rest so they work you know perhaps you know 10 to 20 hours a week the average agricultural laborer well would work for 40 to 60 hours a week so far more effort going into agriculture and for much less return so um you know uh, the Normally, they, uh, they, you know, obviously you don't, you don't have the opportunity. There isn't, sorry, this is. Uh, I can hear some. Uh, anyway, this, you know, you, you, they didn't have a very rich diet, a very uh, a varied diet. Um, so, you know, standards of living until a few hundred years ago remained very low. So you have this explosion, this population explosion. Humanity becomes far, far more sensitive. Far more, far more people covering much more of the earth, but you did not have a revolution in the lifestyles of most people. So we leave episode two on the question of how, you know, what happens next? How do we develop the affluence that much of the world now enjoys? It's affluence, as I say, that compares to the kind of, it's, it's beyond actually. I mean, think walking into a supermarket is beyond the kind of, you know, a, a, a king you know, in the Middle Ages, the idea that they could have such plenty, you know, available to them is unthinkable. You know, we live lifestyles that are rich to an extent that we, you know, it's barely imaginable how different our lives now are in a modern developed country, reasonably wealthy people, than people even, you know, in our forebears, remember, you know, perhaps 15 generations ago, lived in kind of what we would consider kind of beyond absolute poverty and ab abject poverty. So that development, that kind of miracle of affluence that has happened in the last 300 years is thanks, of course, and you would have guessed if you may have listened to the programs, is of course due to another energy revolution, the revolution of the industrial revolution, which was the ability of human beings to access fossil fuels and use fossil fuels no, go away. So I've got children pestering me. Just please go away and let me be. Um, uh, so yeah, so the so fossil fuels created this other this 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 new revolution, the ability to 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 capture the embodied energy of millions of years of uh, of plant growth of of harvesting the energy of the sun embodied in the in the deposits of coal, uh, oil, and gas which then allowed us to create engines that allowed us to, to travel around the world, to outsource labor. We didn't have to do it ourselves anymore. We had these wonderful, obviously in the first instance with our draft animals as we discussed earlier, but now we had these amazing machines that accessed unthinkable amounts of energy. We had an amazing statistic, one of our interviewees, I walked around the, uh, the science museum with this guy and he, we went, I mean, the science museum is incredible when you, when you think about what it's got in there, you know, you know Stevenson's rocket, the Newcomen, original Newcomen engines, these are the first 
you know, the humanity's first uh, effort to capture fossil fuel and use it for productive purposes. And they're there, you know, they're just down the road. So as it opens up, do go and see them. And you can see the evolution from these very early and very primitive and very not and certainly very inefficient machines. You can literally walk through two galleries and get they don't have a Saturn rocket, but they have a, they do have rockets. There. But you can go from a couple of horsepower all the way to a Saturn rocket, which I think is 160 million horsepower. Um, and that's enough then to kind of liberate us from the bonds of Earth, if you like, and get us into space. So that's the kind of that's the journey that we made as a result of uh, of, of the use of fossil fuels. One of the really interesting um, uh, areas that we looked at, again, was like the neural network that we talked about when we're talking about the developing brains. In the same way, there's evidence that uh, as cities develop, towns and cities and communities develop, they use less energy, they become more efficient. They, you, know, you need shorter roads, you need uh, shorter wires to electrical cables if in more dense communities. So they're more efficient, efficient in their use of resources. They also seem to be more efficient in terms of their productivity and their ability to innovate. So you've got another great engine of kind of progress, if you like, as a result of the ability of us to pack ourselves into cities. We developed a more efficient machine for developing ideas and developing new innovations. New innovations leading to more efficient use of energy, releasing new energy sources, and therefore allowing us to do kind of more and more stuff. So you saw this so as throughout this progress, first 500,000 years, very little happens. It's a bit quicker during agriculture, the next 10,000 years. Then the last 300 years, we've seen the speed of development of, of both technological and societal transformation accelerate in a way that's unbelievable. And I think we can all look back and think of our own lifetimes of the amazing technological changes that are you know, in the history of humanity, you know, human beings haven't had to cope with the kind of changes that we've lived. Uh, you know, I mean, for me, just think about the evolution of the automobile, you know, think about the original motor cars and how kind of inefficient they are. And now the kind of, you know, a sleek new Tesla, you know, that's you know, dispensed with uh, internal combustion engine. These are extraordinary kind of uh, developments that have happened and accelerating all the time. So there is this pattern of, uh, you know, of, of a, a feedback loop that has encouraged a faster and faster development of technology. Again, rooted in our ability to access these huge sources of power. And that's where we leave episode three. Uh, and the question then, of course, at the end of episode three is, we are now all becoming all too aware of the consequences of using the fabulous wealth in this, you know, unbelievable productive period of geology. Um, where, where, I mean, sorry, this is another little aside, but I think we've got the time for it. Um, the Carboniferous period was when the first, so plants, as they began to colonize the earth, sort of 500 million years ago, I think about, um, they, they, didn't, they didn't need structures when, when plants developed in the oceans. So as they came on the earth, it was kind of quite beneficial to be able to kind of rise up and spread out and capture more sunlight. So that's when they developed the cells that allow the structure of stalks and leaves and that kind of thing. But at the time, there weren't any animals or termites or, you know, that could break down those cell walls. So our, the, the coal, oil and gas, much of was what was the result of the Carboniferous when these great forests were growing in the then hot, wet world. These great forests grew and there was nothing that could consume the hard cellular matter. So it just grew, great mounds of it grew. And then it obviously, you know, as we know, it was compressed and heated and, and, and became the fossil fuel that we use. But it was, this dates back to this unique about 100 million years, a, a, geographic, a, a, a geological epoch when, you know, we, it, was the, 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 it was a uniquely you know, propitious, uh, you could say, for the for the for the storage of these energy supplies and there we, we we were burrowing in and accessing this ready supply of energy and using it kind of with hindsight in a sort of frivolous way. although uh, you know obviously um and 
uh, you know, the you know the fact that our desire to kind of access this obviously is understandable. Now we face the challenge, of course, that we have to migrate from this great store of energy, which remember we're consuming ever more of. Um, our, you know, the consumption of energy has increased incredibly dramatically. If you look at the history of the concentration of carbon dioxide, the store, because carbon dioxide hangs around in the atmosphere for a very long time, the stock of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased. I, I mean, I, honestly, I can't remember the statistics, but it's stunning. So since, I think it's doubled since Al Gore published his, his book, um, uh, which, whose name I've now embarrassingly forgotten, but I do have on the shelves here. Um, uh, uh, somebody will remember it. If you remember it, put it in the comments box. So when Al Gore published his famous book in the what late eighties, um, you know uh, the stock of carbon in the atmosphere has doubled since then. A measure of the huge increase in the consumption of fossil fuels. And when you think, looking around the world, how the societies of the world have changed, that isn't surprising. Look at the China. Look at the incredible wealth that's been generated in China. Look how many people have been lifted out of poverty in China as a result, of course, of the use of these huge amounts of fossil energy. And that is the challenge. Our, what, seven, eight billion people on Earth now need to find ways, ideally, well, I mean, not just ideally, we need to find ways to maintain a similar kind of affluent lifestyle, but wean ourselves away from these stores of fossil energy and to, you know, the diurnal cycle, the daily cycle of solar energy once again. And that is a huge challenge. And in a way, the object of the series was to set up the scale of that challenge and say to people, look, think of how much in your world is a result of you know, using ever more energy. And, and that is the challenge. That's the scale of the challenge we face. It is no exaggeration to say that tackling climate change the kind of changes we need to make as a society are unprecedented in the history of our species. You know, everything, the way we do everything, everything we do, everything we have, in some way it's touched by, is the result of our use of fossil fuels. We need to stop all of that and find new ways to create huge amounts of energy. And of course, whilst the sun delivers a lot of energy, it's diffuse, it's spread out. The sun's heat, I mean, it, it's warm, but it isn't nearly as warm as you know, as. Uh, the gas on your stove or indeed the explosive power of petrol. We need to find ways to create that kind of energy impact, that kind of, that, that kind of energy density using the diffuse energy of the sun. So the next, the last series, the last in our series, we, I mean, look, you know, to be honest, uh, myself and Lawrence, my uh, collaborator on this, we decided to be deliberately optimistic and to sort of say, look, there are, there are optimistic kind of, uh, systems at play here, systems that may make it easier than people sometimes say to do what we're doing. We wanted to make the point that, for example, in the last couple of decades, but very in a very accelerated fashion in the last decade, the price of some of the keys to accessing renewable energy have become cheaper, you know, in a way that was unimaginable, that no one believed was possible when, uh, when they were first developed. So solar panels have gone from being, you know, I mean, they were first developed to be used on spaceships that would go up into space. They were unbelievably expensive. I, I actually have this not in my series, but we did a story. The first commercial people to buy solar panels were cannabis growers in California in the 60s who were living out in the fields and growing these great cannabis farms. They had loads of money from selling the drugs that they were growing and they wanted to be able to listen to radios and play their hi-fis and stuff. And they discovered that there was this incredible new, obviously that wasn't, you know, wasn't possible then, you didn't have little generators and stuff like that. They discovered there was this incredible technology, these panels you could put up and they should generate enough power for you to be able to play a radio. And so they were the first people to kind of go, they could, to say like, hey, look, we wouldn't mind some of this stuff that NASA's developed for satellites. Um, but they were being incredibly to now in many parts of the world being the cheapest source of energy uh, the, 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 the speed of the price fall of, uh, of wind turbines has been slower, but the technical developments in wind turbines have been very rapid too. Um, if you think about, I mean, there's a reason why they get bigger and bigger. They are absolutely huge. Some wind turbines are 300 meters per meter high. Um, they're that high because what determines how much power it creates 
is a, it's very complicated, but it's a cube function of the length of the, uh, of the, of the turbine. Because it, because as the turbine sweeps, it defines the area, and as the area grows, it grow, you know, it, it grows at a as a cubed function. So the longer the blades, you get far, far more power. Which is why, do you remember, fifteen years ago, everybody talked about having little wind turbines on their roofs, and that was the way. And uh, David Cameron was going to get one, and then we. This is something. This sounds a little bit self-serving, but we did a story on Newsnight as part of my Ethical Man project, where we made this point that the physics of Wind turbines meant that small turbines just were, like, well, however well made they were, were never going to be anywhere near as efficient as big ones. And indeed, they probably never pay off the embodied energy in them. So, uh, and then suddenly David Cameron wasn't going to get a wind turbine in his house. And, you know, the whole kind of fashion for small wind turbines went away. That's why you see, you know, huge ships de delivering unimaginably long blades out into the North Sea, because that's the most efficient way to develop to, to generate huge amounts of power so sorry that's a slight digression they're expensive to build but they're delivering way more power now i think for a single sweep of the biggest turbines blades will power the average home for a, a, a year so that's the kind of scale of energy so they are getting good at uh, at uh, at generating power but still very hard to compete with coal um, and but we wanted to make that point that part of the reason why they've become so cheap is a is another network effect it's a net it's it's a result of globalization and to be credit where credit's due it's a result of the chinese's efforts over the last two decades to invest in developing these industries at scale so huge industries which allow scale production scale you know it's a, it's the kind of you know the the law of manufacturing that the more you make the bigger the scale you manufacture you get returns to scale and your product becomes cheaper and that's happened very very dramatically with solar power and a bit less dramatically but still quite dramatically with uh, wind turbines it's beginning to happen with batteries it's beginning to happen with electric cars so you see this wonderful kind of positive feedback loop and obviously as it gets cheaper stops needing subsidy and uh and then you know the private investment comes in, makes the investments we need to begin, for example, to switch over to renewable power for our energy systems. That is why, you know, Bob Johnson and Joe Biden can talk about the possibility of decarbonizing the, their electricity systems. This isn't the whole energy system. This is just electricity. Decarbonizing electricity by 2035. So, you know, what, 13 and a half years. That's a pretty astonishing claim to be able to make, but it is plausible because now it's not governments that are spending the money, but private companies. And that's what's quite interesting. I don't know if you saw Boris had a 10 point green plan and he talked about the British ambition to build 30 uh, gigawatts of new capacity, which is like basically our average consumption, uh, you know, again, but in renewable power by 2030, I think it was. And then he, when you, when you, if, when you, print the investment that the government was going to make to deliver that was actually only 160 million pounds uh, and the reason why it, it, it was because the private sector is going to do the investing and the government can spare and let it happen so you know the, that's not a government initiative it's actually a private initiative and the 160 million is to invest to make our some ports bigger so they can take these huge wind turbines and that is another flaw in the government's vision of this Saudi Arabia of wind you've probably heard the expression he says it every time he talks about the environment that's all but if you've got German Siemens German it's actually a German Spanish venture that makes the blades German company making the blades and a Danish company Orsted installing the blades in the North Sea I'm not sure the extent to which maybe it's our wind but the but the jobs of the technology is outside and that is a big challenge for Britain and another digression for me so the idea was to sort of in the final program was to make this point that there are some positive feedback loops that may allow us to uh to to, to begin to tackle the problem maybe faster than people thought i think it is quite extraordinary that we can talk about talk realistically about decarbonizing our energy systems within a you know kind of decade america's electricity system decarbonized in just over a decade is an extraordinary achievement um, and uh, so let's, where am I at? Oh, there was one other thought, there's one other point I wanted to make off the back of the, um, yeah, but it, it, but it does leave huge challenges still to, and huge opportunities. That's the other thing I wanted, 
I, I'm very keen to say, look, there are big changes that we need to make as a society, but these changes allow, will we'll create new opportunities, you know, um, and we should be more positive about how change can be uplifting and, in, in, and invigorating and positive for, for human beings. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, for example, you know, this the big kind of really knotty challenge in the UK is how on earth we heat our homes. As we know, they're all virtually all heated by gas at the moment. North, I mean, obviously that's a fossil fuel. Um, there's not gonna be as much of it. We can probably produce some hydrogen with surplus energy on windy days um, from our huge fields of wind turbines that we intend to build, but probably, well, almost certainly not enough to power our homes because if you make hydrogen and then you, um, it, it's it's quite inefficient. There's quite a few transitions you need to make. It's actually more efficient just to and then you use electricity. So the idea is to switch to these heat pumps you've probably heard about, which are reverse. Um, they're basically essentially reverse refrigerators. So instead of cooling an area down, they warm the area up using the same kind of forms of compression as chemicals actually as uh, as, as fridges. Um, and the problem with them is they're big, bulky, and they are expensive. Um, we need there are about 30 million homes that will need them in Britain. Um, and the other way of looking at it is that is a great business opportunity. That is a fantastic business waiting, you know, to be to be to be exploited. Um, and you know, there are lots of people who think that the government should be seeing that as an opportunity and investing in companies now, right now, because it's going to start happening quickly. We're going to start needing to do this. That are going to develop the heat pumps, not just that we can use here in Britain. Thirty million, remember, thirty million. They cost between six and eighteen thousand pounds each at the moment. This is, you know, truly massive business. But of course, heat pumps will be needed needed all over the world. So, so you know, another kind of message that we need to we need to invest to create the new technologies, and crucially, we need to create them at scale. Just as with solar power, the more you make, the cheaper they get. The easier it is then for for the forces of the market to begin to propagate them throughout the uh, the country and of course the world as well so that's where we left it just as a coda a final an end point um lawrence and i have uh, 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 want to make another sweeping history uh for radio 4 we're trying to persuade them now to do and the next one the plan is to do a, a kind of geochemical history of the earth itself so instead of starting a million years ago with the first primates that became Homo sapiens, we start with the beginning of the world and uh, what makes, makes the world such a propitious place for, for life to develop. Uh, and, you know, the circumstances, there's growing consensus among scientists about the circumstances that life began. And then we'd look at the interaction between living organisms and the geology and uh, atmospheric chemistry of the earth and how that led to the proliferation of species ultimately to us and then you know, we'll look ahead to what our future might be. So that's our, that's, look out for that. We're trying to do that. The idea would be to land that starting at the beginning of October and ending just as with this, the vision of how, I, there's a really interesting, there's some work done on how much, you know, the assumption is, and probably a correct assumption that we will become extinct at some time in geological terms, the blink of an eye and our entire existence will be the blink of an eye in geological terms. And they've looked and said, you know, like a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand a million, million years time, what record will we in the fossil records? We talk about the Anthropocene, almost nothing, a, a, a millimeter, you know, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a huge cliff of rock that will be the legacy of humanity on earth. And that's where we thought we might end that series, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, I hope we've had some questions. I've been talking for rather longer than I thought I would be able to, but uh, we, we've done a lot of the series and, uh, and um, a lot to talk. So you're gonna, you're gonna, we move to questions now? Uh, yes, um, thank you very much, Justin. That's a phenomenal tour de force and covered in an enormous area. Um, the whole history of humanity. The whole history, exactly, the whole history of humanity. So one can start off almost anywhere, really. But um, I think um, Catherine has posed quite a lot of 
difficult questions, really. I think challenging the whole assumption oh. which all your talk Go is based in a way. So that if we look at what she's written, and I'll read this out, and if she'd like to come in, she can do so. But firstly, is there a case that speed of change has downsides for our mental health? I think you said at one point that um, change can be positive and invigorating. So this is putting an alternative point of view that maybe too much change is more than some people can bear. I don't know if you want to take that one because she then goes into a little bit more depth about um, the way in which um, our environment is, has been exploited in various ways, which is a slightly different yeah, thing. I, but I, um, don't comment on that. <clears throat> well, I, 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 you know, you're not comparing like with like. I think obviously it is destabilizing. Change can be destabilizing. Other people, I mean, it depends on your, you know, your kind of predispositions. You know, some people can find change really invigorating. Um, uh, and you've got to, you've got to think back to the kind of things. Well, I mean, some of us have endured the Second World War. I mean, is is the kind of, I mean, the pandemic obviously is about the closest analog, you know, in terms of a societal challenge to the Second World War that any of us have experienced. But, you know, is most of what we experience in the modern world worse than what happened in the Second World I don't think so. And, like, we don't talk about, you know, the kind of mental health effects of the Second World War. I mean, creatures of the times in which we live and we adapt to cope with it. And I think we, you know, there's, you've got to think, I mean, the way that kind of, I was talking about the geological scale of humanity's legacy a moment ago, you've got to think, um, you know, over what time scale are you talking? Yeah, I mean, social media is disruptive for children now, but, you know, so uh, magazines and pop music, you know, when I was born, mag people were worried about the, you know, awful influences of those things on teenagers, uh, you know, and so our concerns and preoccupations, you probably at any time that you're in, you probably think something pretty awful and worrying has happened. I'm sure, you know, 450,000 years ago, you know, people were hitting each other on the heads with rocks and that probably causing all, you know, everybody to be anxious, you know, I mean, the point I'm making is that at any given historical moment, the you, the preoccupy, you preoccupations of the time will seem very important, but perhaps with the hindsight, uh, maybe aren't quite quite so bad. So I, do, I mean, yeah, progress has its costs, but it has its benefits as well. And you know, the affluence, you know, that point I made about the incredible affluence that we mm. we enjoy now is is perhaps a benefit. And yeah, for some people, there may be cost for their mental health. I hope that's an answer. I, yes. I've got a feeling, Catherine, that you're probably not satisfied with that. I, I, I suppose the question is whether the sort of acceleration that you've described can go on indefinitely, or does there come a point at which, you know, it is decided by humanity that enough is enough? I mean, clearly that isn't the case at the moment, generally. Well, I mean, it, the thesis, mm. the thesis mm. of the program is mm. that if, if, I mean, it, look, if the program had a clear thesis, it would be that mm. development is closely related to the amount of energy that we're exploiting. And we have progressively exploited, you know, way far, far greater amounts of energy. If we're required to make this transition, unless there's some, you know, miracle of, um, uh, um, uh, you know, of, of energy technology that allows us unlimited supplies of energy, we presumably will have to moderate our energy demands because whilst renewable energy can perhaps meet our current energy needs, particularly if more efficient, and we use things like uh, electric cars and obviously low voltage lights and stuff have been a revolution in saving energy and lighting, we can probably meet them, but we probably can't expect an accelerating use of energy um, and so uh, maybe that will make that's needed to slow down what I described as a virtuous circle but I can see you, it wouldn't necessarily have to be conceived that way but the feedback loop that has has accelerated development in the way that it seems to have done so maybe there is a natural break built in to our adaptation to climate change who knows. Um, a couple of forms of energy that um, you hadn't particularly mentioned um, I don't know whether you wanted to come on onto that or whether they're in the program. I mean, one is nuclear energy um, and perhaps your thoughts about that. And um, I was thinking while you were talking about all this, as you know, the ancient Greek Aristotle, I think, had kind of divided um, the world up into four elements, earth, air, fire and water. 
And there was a resonance in almost all of those. I don't think you touched on water. And water is another, um, you know, method for producing energy, which has been in use for quite a long time. And hydroelectric schemes around the world have been quite significant, certainly in China. I don't know if it compares with what's being developed now, but have you any thoughts about those? And perhaps, uh, one, yeah. I don't, yes, and the, and, the, and the other thing was, I think just the other day, maybe a day or two ago, there was a um, program on the news about the Eden Project. I don't know whether you saw that, uh, but you may be aware of what they're up to there, which is, you know, creating an enormous borehole and sinking, you know, this contraption into it in order to um, release geothermal energy. And apparently if we do a few of those over the country, we could satisfy all the energy requirements um, just from geothermal energy. So those are just three areas. Maybe you comment on those and then we'll come back to some of uh, Catherine's comments. Now, I think the truth is we need uh, we need to get our, we need to find you know carbon ways to mm. generate any low carbon way of generating electricity is preferable to uh, using fossil fuels. Um, you know, and I, if you look online, I've, I've written an article about this. The the effects of radiation. You know, it was assumed that even low levels of radiation had the same effects as higher levels of radiation so it was a kind of linear mm. scale you know you, you it was still an effect even at low levels of radiation the evidence seems to be now that that isn't true that our bodies we've grown up the radio the world is radioactive um you know bananas are, are radioactive seawater is radioactive shampoo is radioactive you know there are lots of things in the world you know if you live in cornwall you're exposed to very high levels of radiation we grew up we, we evolved as a species in a radioactive world and the evidence seems to be that low level is something that our bodies can cope with and I've written a, an article looking at, at radiation events in history including Chernobyl, Fukushima and and the uh, the bombs on at Nagasaki and Hiroshima and and show, showing that the evidence collected by the, invest, the UN investigators shows much lower levels of uh, illness associated with them than we thought all of which being a way of saying that perhaps we worry a little bit too much about the, the the risks of nuclear power i'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned obviously if nuclear power stations blow up they deliver huge amounts they potentially can deliver very large amounts of radiation to people so obviously very high levels of safety are required and a huge investment in that but measured against risks here measured against the known risks of climate change i think that should be part of my personal view, the nuclear Afraid you're just breaking up, Justin. If you can hear me, I think you may need to repeat what I'm just at the moment. Which uh, was on them, but they are. Yeah, so hopefully I'm back. So I was saying, I was saying that low levels of radiation don't seem to. I don't know if you've lost me. And uh, can you hear no, me? Gotcha. Yeah, so low levels of radiation don't appear to be as damaging as we assumed. Uh, uh, I was saying, therefore, I think nuclear power should be part of our energy mix. We should invest in it, but it's very expensive. Um, so can't it can't it what can't be the only thing we do, and probably isn't even the most economically efficient. But given that we need to develop, we need to tackle this problem rapidly. We need to try and reduce carbon emissions as soon as possible, because as we discussed. The stock of carbon as it builds up is the problem, not the flow of carbon. So the more that we put into the atmosphere, the less kind of environmental space we have to operate in and stay within the kind of limits, the temperature rises that we know are safe. So I would say, yes, it should be part of the mix. And certainly countries like Germany, the fact that green parties in Germany are saying we should shut down nuclear power stations that have only been running for one or two decades that have 30, 40 years of productive life left, uh, seems to me a nonsense. Um, so we should do that. Um, uh, hydropower is a good source of energy. You know, it, it, it's heavy, it delivers a lot of power. So if you've got a fast river, you can get a lot of energy. It's very disruptive mm. for ecosystems, changing the rates of flow of rivers. So there are huge kind of consequences, environmental consequences, different, different class of environmental consequences, but there are environmental consequences. 
also, most of the big rivers already have hydro plants on them. There's a limit to how much hydroelectricity we can get. Um, they're big, bulky uh, bits of investment. Um, it, 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 you know, again, perhaps we can use... Lost you again. ...kind of... ...you discover there are you're going to, you know, there's a plethora, loads, loads of different solutions need to be considered. We need, we need to do lots of different things. Um, I don't know if you can hear me or not. I'm getting the impression from your body language, Anthony, that I went missing for a bit there. You went, you, yes, it was broken up for a bit, but I think we got the gist of it. Good, good. Um, should we go back to one yes, of Catherine's go, questions? I haven't seen the questions. So, question. so um, she says, um, you haven't talked about minerals, including metals like tin and copper, etc., whether used for weapons earlier and now batteries, etc. So we continue to use up limited resources. There's one thing about resource use. Um, you may as well, I think, go through the rest of them. You perhaps yeah, that is an interesting. Well, let's do the resources because that is a really interesting question. And yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, we and uh, yeah, the smelting of metals was a crucial. You know, there's a reason why the ages are determined by you know stone and then uh, uh, bronze and then iron uh, because they were so transformational for humanity. Another way, just when you think about it, of converting uh, energy into something useful is smelting, releasing the properties of the uh, metal ores. Uh, so, um, but. Um, uh, you know, I did a piece on, I did a piece recently on these efforts to, uh, there are in, in the, on the abyssal plains, the deep ocean, you know, four kilometers below the surface of the ocean, there, uh, the, the, these nodules, concentrated nodules of, of, of chemicals, of, of metals have, uh, have formed over an unbelievable period of time, it, like each millimeter of the, of these nodules takes a, a million years to form. So I had a small nodule, it was kind of about this big, and you looked at it and you thought that has to be kind of, you know, 400, 300 million years old, incredibly old, an incredible kind of legacy, geologic legacy of, uh, of the earth. Um, but the abyssal plain covers half of the earth's surface, right? And I mean, the, the concentrations of these nodules are different in different parts. But it, you can get kind of tons of metal from a square meter, you know, large, maybe not tons, I might be exaggerating, but large amounts of metal from a square meter. There's, there's not much light down at the ocean at that level. So there are kind of tube worms and various kind of animals and a few fish that live down there, but the density and the diversity of life is much lower than it is on the surface. Um, there is this trade-off, this terrible dilemma that humanity faces. Do we allow these companies to send these harvesting machines down these huge kind of, you know, they're like uh, they're like uh, plows that go and they scrape the surface of the uh, of the of the seabed and you know lift up the uh, these, uh, nodules and then they use compressed air to send them up tubes to the surface and then smelt them and release the chemicals. Some of these are key batteries: copper, uh, nickel, cobalt, uh, manganese key battery metals, metals that we're going to need if we're going to have all those electric cars that we're told are our destiny. Um, uh, but they will destroy these ecosystems, which again, because they're, it's cold, they evolve, they grow very slowly, they live for a very long time, and you do irreparable damage to them. And it was quite interesting because I went to the Natural History Museum and met one of the um, scientists who studies the creatures that live down there. And he said, look, it's a, it's a trade-off. You know, if we need these metals and it's about the long-term future of the species, but also of the planet, you know, stabilizing the temperatures of the planet, you know, maybe sacrificing some of it. He said, look, let's, it's so big, there's so much of it. And remember that these metals are recyclable. So the battery, we're getting much better at stripping out these rare metals from the batteries afterwards. <clears throat> and it's a huge, again, another very potentially very profitable industry. Um, you know, once you've dug them up and concentrated them, 
you know, it's a much red and ready source of these metals. Um, uh, you know, you've got, you know, you, you, we, you know, we have to make a decision and there will be sacrifices that we make. And we're already making decisions about allocating our effort of mining by deciding, for example, you know, the great mines that there are around the world that are so destructive, you know, often, uh, you know, they're, the metals that we need are in rainforests and we have to clear the forests and, you know, move huge amounts of earth and, you know, huge amounts of kind of disruption, huge amounts of uh, animals and species disrupted or killed. Um, yeah, there are trade-offs. We will, you know, there's a lot of us. We, you know, we all demand high standards of living and those who don't have them now are saying that they need it too. And there is an equity that says they should to be allowed to live a similar or, you know, a, a, a spy, at least aspire to make sure can't, you don't get anything by right. We have to create the ability of the earth to sustain us as a species. But you can understand that as human beings, they say, why shouldn't I have what you've got? Or maybe you should have a bit less and I could have a bit more. And those, those, those arguments have to happen. And in a, in a world in which we live in nation states, it's very hard to have those equity arguments without conflict, why should Britain remain rich and India be poor? Why should India not have the benefits of fossil fuel? These are really complex questions. And they, the, the, uh, in a sense, and this maybe isn't an adequate answer for you, Catherine, but in a sense, the compromise, the, the way to resolve this tricky conundrum would be to find ways to allow our lifestyles to continue and use much more efficient energy systems for example, electric cars, and that may mean exploiting new resources. But um, I don't know. I look back at the, you just think about the, the 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 unbelievable kind of damage you could, you know, or the you know the opportunity of civilization that was that we did, but the unbelievable damage that humanity has already done to the earth. So even before before farming, you know, when when we first developed as a species, there were all, as you probably know, all sorts of megafauna, you know, giant wombats and, you know, huge kind of, you know, saber-toothed tigers. And, you know, there's, there's no coincidence that if you look at America, all of the megafauna die out in the... ...you know, up into, into, uh, uh, into the Americas and then migrated down through. They all died out within a thousand years because we killed them all. We have wreaked unbelievable damage on the earth already. And obviously, the, you know, and that doesn't mean that we've got a license to do more, but if we're gonna get out of the pickle that we find ourselves in now, we do need to find the resources that'll let us do it. And therefore I think there is an argument and it has to be a debate. We have to talk about it we, as a society to do it, but there will have to be, there will We'll have compromises like those deep sea metals will have to be grappled with um so uh, and that is happening now there's a, there's a un body that uh, that that is making decisions and probably issuing licenses within the next year or so to allow the fur which suggests i have to say that the decisions already been made but it looks likely that the first exploratory licenses will be allowed really very soon for those big machines to start harvesting the abyssal plains of the earth. Yes, sorry, I think you've just frozen again. Actually, I think you've frozen, no you haven't. No, no I'm, I'm there. <laughs> I, I mean, there's another point uh, that Catherine raises about this um, sort of exploitation in respect of minerals, which is the exploitation of very young children who are employed in the DRC um, to, uh, to, to, yeah. to to harvest the the metal I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, one could argue one could argue of course that ch children used to be used as chimney sweeps you know but that doesn't mean that we're justified in saying well we did it before we'll do it again so i mean what what do you have to say to that well again it's a isn't it i mean you know i mean we need cobalt to make the uh to, for, to make the the um in the batteries um you know at the moment it comes from the congo like i say it could come from the if you get it from the Congo, you're exploiting ch children. And if you get it from the abyssal plains, you're destroying tube worms and ecosystems that have developed over hundreds of millions of years and have existed untouched. Um, and yeah, these are really tough choices. I mean, you know, most of the destruction that humanity's wrought, we did either believing that it was progress, that kind of idea of the frontier, that's such a key idea in American culture, 
you know, or, you know, we did it inadvertently, unknowingly. And I suppose in a way, I mean, I don't know if this is an encouraging thought for you, Catherine, but I suppose we're more knowledgeable about the effects we're having on the earth than we've ever been before. And so hopefully, and I'm, this isn't always the case, I know, but hopefully we're getting better at making decisions and deciding how we make choices between all these really difficult things. But I don't think there are any clear answers. I don't think, you know, you know I mean, you know, there, there are always going to be really uncomfortable trade-offs. And like I come back to that point that was the kind of, you know, the part of the inspiration for the series and part of the reason why I'm so keen to do the job of being this chief environment correspondent job I've got at the BBC is because of the scale. You know, I just think, you know, people don't realise how big a challenge we face. They don't realise how terrible the effects of global warming could be. Maybe not in 50, we always look at 50 years and think about it. Why don't we stop at 50 years? What about 100 years? What about 300 years? Because the gases that we put in the atmosphere are not going anywhere unless we develop unbelievable new technologies. You know, these negative uh, emissions technologies, most of which if we do develop them, we'll have to use because we're going to have to still go on doing things which create uh, greenhouse gases. So they're initially at least going to be sucking those gases out. They won't be hoovering the, you know, the, the legacy of the industrial revolution out of the atmosphere for a long, long time, in which case we're, we're, you know, we're committed to large amounts of climate change. We, one of the messages we want to make from the, uh, this geochemical history idea that we had was to say, well, look, let's look back. Let's look back at when the last time carbon dioxide uh, concentrations were at 450, 500 parts per million as they are now, right? What they were in the pre-industrial period, they doubled. A lag for you know, these gases have their effect. You know, take the sea absorbs human, huge amounts of, uh, of heat and very slowly warms and there are all consequences happening in the oceans. You don't really want to think about, but my point being, there's a big long lag. What, what, what was the world like? You know, I can't, it's about, I think it's about 200,000 years ago when temperature, when um, carbon dioxide levels were the same as they are now. Well, sea level was 128 meters higher than it is today. And we talk about being worried, oh no, West Antarctic meltdown, you know, it's three and a half meters, Greenland, seven meters. That, that implies that the whole of the Antarctic will melt, melt out. That delivers us about 70 meters or something. You know, huge, well, there were tropical forests in Antarctica and, and the Arctic. So, uh, you know, there was, that's how, that's what the last time we had com our carbon concentration. So whatever the, the short term are, you know, the, the, the earth model that delivers us what might happen as a result suggests something far, far worse. And, uh, you know, so, you know, that's the, that's the kind of risk that we face. And, you know, the challenge is getting to grips with it and beginning to be able to transition as as possible to lower carbon technologies. So we face this unbelievable challenge and that is going to make, it's going to mean uncomfortable choices and, you know, ultimately may mean that, you know, we have to sacrifice the thing that's most precious to us, our affluent lifestyles. And it's going to be very hard. And there is a really interesting, and this is something that I want to explore more in my work, the really interesting issue, which is that democratic societies are uniquely bad at making those kind of tough decisions. You know, I mean, I don't want to, this is not a, kind of, uh, you know, I'm not saying that we need to go to become, you know, dictatorships, autocracies, but China, for example, far more constant and, and you know, single-minded focus on the environment than, for example, America. And when Biden came in, I don't know if you remember, they had a meeting in Canada where the Chinese spent like, you know, probably at these, these great meetings, you know, everybody's very civil to each other. The Chinese spent like 15 minutes saying, you know, America is such a bad partner on climate and you talk to us and you suggest that, you know, we should do this or the other. We're the ones who've done all the hard work and, you know, you keep changing your views. And if you think from China's point of view, I mean, look, there are all sorts of things that are abhorrent about China, but from China's point of view, they're like, we recognize this is a problem. We've highlighted it as an issue and we've been working on this consistently for 20 years. And then the, you know, Biden turns up and, the, you know, look who pressed him. I mean, Trump didn't, 
you know, give a monkeys about climate change, did he? He didn't make any investments. He cut back, he rolled back all the, uh, you know, the, the, the regulations in a to allow, you know, the fossil fuel companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you're the Chinese, you know, democracies don't look very efficient and effective. And that's another great, Catherine, another great challenge that our societies face. How do we make those tough decisions and say to our people, you know, for example, you need carbon pricing. You need to put a price on carbon to persuade you that it's worth getting rid of that hydrogen boiler and putting in that expensive heat pump that we were talking about earlier. So really tough choices on all sorts of levels, but you know, a re an existential threat for humanity. Maybe leaving us that, you know, that millimeter thin residue in the fossil record in a hundred thousand years time. Or maybe we'll still be around, who knows? Right, well, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm afraid it looks as if your arguments have persuaded Catherine, who's decided that she's off. So we, I, she's raised a lot of questions. I think we're she raised a lot of questions about China. We're talking about, me and Catherine are talking about... Oh, she doesn't like China. She doesn't, doesn't I, I think, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think we'll go into it now, but I mean, she's raised a lot of uh, objections or queries about what China's actually up to. And I think it's when you were talking about the great developments that China was making in the area of renewables. And it, 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 oh, well, I'm talking, you know, we're talking about slightly different things, well, I think, Catherine. <laughs> I'm talking about, I was talking specifically on the climate issue. I'm not talking about the Uyghurs or Taiwan or anything like that. Um, so no, I, I think, think we're slightly... I think this was all to do with their use of coal and so on and so forth. But I think at this particular point... He's absolutely you know, right. They use a lot of coal. If other people have not got any questions, I just wanted to round this off by asking a question about you, actually, Justin, if I might. And I think Peter mentioned in his introduction um, about your work as ethical man on Newsnight, where I think you tried to commit to as environmentally friendly a lifestyle as, as possible, if I recollect. And I think that it's, this is an interesting form of reportage, which you use in other circumstances as well. And I know that you did in relation to these four programs, like deciding that you're gonna try and not eat meat for a week or, so, or, or eat raw food, I think, for a week or something like that, much to the um, dismay of your family. And, uh, and the family come in as well, so that your wife becomes the ethical wife while you were the ethical man and so on. And um, I'm, I'm just sort of interested, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting combination of the kind of sub objective reporting where you just go and report on what's going on or you interview people and the subjective where you throw yourself into the situation and can describe it from the inside. And I, perhaps you could just finish up with your reflections on this method of working and also about any particular issues that arise, particularly in relation to bringing your family into it and how that all works out. Uh, my wife's sitting just, it's my wife's sitting just out there. Um, I think that kind of, that, the original idea for that kind of, um, you know, method journalism, you might call it, you know, like method actors who get into their parts, have to live the part in order to mm. act the, uh, act the, so the kind of method journalism thing wasn't my initiative initially. It was uh, it came from the editor of Newsnight idea for the Ethical Man project, which mm. if you think about it, actually made it much better because I was forced to do it. I didn't actually want to do it. I don't know mm. that came across. And and when you talk about the role of my wife, she was actually much and still is much greener in terms of her day to day. Well, yes. greener, greener in every way. Uh, and so she was actually she actually found it quite empowering because she was like, right now you've got to do this stuff. So, um, so in that sense, it worked quite well. Um, but, but the other, the other point, the other point was that it was such a, it proved such an effective way to communicate. Again, Catherine, what we were talking about earlier, the dilemmas that you face as of somebody trying to make the right decision in terms of your environmental impact. Um, you know, and I guess I, I mean, I have, I do continue to whenever I can think of a clever ruse for. You know, um, you know, finding a way to explain the nature of a problem by becoming involved. I do have a tendency to do it. It's all partly just be partly because I like that kind of more kind of involving. I enjoy the kind of the, the I enjoy doing those kind of projects. But I do also think that it has a. I mean, maybe this is an ex ante kind of justifying after the event. Uh, I do kind of like I like 
Uh, I do think it's a, a very effective way to communicate to the audience. I think audiences kind of engage with it. But you're right, there is a question about objectivity and, you know, should the journalist, you know, should you use the personal account in journalism and particularly BBC journalism? Um, there is probably, it's probably a little bit more scope to do it in um, environmental uh, area where you're working to kind of objective mostly to her, Catherine's probably going to disagree, but you're working to objective, you know, the, 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 the background of, is a science, you know, you're saying, you're talking about the, the, the impacts that might happen to the world, you know, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, you can rely on the science for, so in that sense, they're objective. Although, of course, there's a huge amount of subjective judgment about what the appropriate solutions are. But anyway, I, look, it, it seems to work. And, uh, I, you know, I haven't had too many complaints. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it's an interesting way. I mean, personally, it's an interesting way to do it and hopefully an effective way to do journalism. Right. Well, thank you very much for that. That's been a very entertaining and instructive evening and I'm sure there's a lot there for people to think about and to disagree with in some cases um, uh, but um, uh, and some more comments are coming through so if you've got a chance to look at those please do um, but I think anyway we'll just just uh, as part of the word of thanks I mean normally um, when we have these events in the library we tend to produce a, a bottle of something drinkable um, as a little gift to the speaker and we can't do that and Peter said I've got to give you a virtual gift and I don't quite know how to do that but anyway you, you've got a virtual gift in the form of our thanks and perhaps we may um, and Peter will organize this as the treasurer be able to send you a small token of our appreciation at some point so uh, anyway thank you very much Justin thank you to everybody else and just to note that our next meeting in this series will be on Thursday the 17th of June when Michael Wood, another BBC figure, will be coming along and I think talking mainly about his travels in China. So look forward oh, to... It is possible. absolutely fabulous. He's a really amazing man. That will be really good. I might tune in for that one. He's, uh, Please do. He did some great stuff in, in India. Please do. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, and good night. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs>